The once bustling factory was more like a ghost town this morning. Pacific Brands bosses kept media at arm's length as the last of the workers packed up and left the premises. Just a few hours later, it was a different scene entirely as some of the ladies gathered to celebrate their time with Bonds. How do you feel about the closure? Um, very sad. Very sad. You've obviously made a lot of good friends. Good friends, a lot of close friends. The community is the one that's going to suffer big time. You know, all the local shops and, and everything around. Sonia and Margaret spent a combined 50 years at the Short Street factory. Both started with bonds as teenagers. It's the end of an era and we just have to move on. Nothing else we can do. Because it was one place the girls could go to if they couldn't have a job, couldn't find a job they wanted. They used to go to bonds. So that's pretty sad. So a lot of young ones will move away, I think. Out of the 65 workers left on the final day, only 20 have secured new jobs. But for now, this tight-knit group is focusing on a job well done. Kate Mitchell, NBN News. It's extremely significant. Um, it's the only banner that I know of from this district. It's one of two banners of Grand United for the whole of Australia. Uh, we had some surfboards and boogie boards set up to give us some shade. Everyone got uh, towels and ice and water for her and um, directed the traffic and uh, it, was, it was really, really good. Take them down a carton of beer or something for them to enjoy and just to say thank you because um, I haven't got to see them since I've had, had him. Whatever impact the Denny Wicks case is having on Chris Houston, it wasn't showing today as he mixed with teammates at a beach training session. I think he's pretty confident that um, he hasn't really got any issues in, in the Danny Wicks affair. So, you know, he's back at training, smiling on his face and enjoying himself and, and confident that, you know, um, he's done the right thing. Named as a potential witness against his former housemate, Houston preferred not to speak publicly, but it's obvious the coach who's in his rookie NRL year himself, has concerns about what effect it all could have on the pending NRL season. No doubt we're in for a, a decent time over the next couple of months. Um, you know, we, we've got to, as a club, um, put together a strategy to make sure that we shield the players as much as we can. They're keen to make sure that the work they've done this off-season is, is, is not getting derailed in any way. One thing is for sure, Wicks isn't part of his plans. You won't be on our roster, mate. In contrast, there's every chance Joel Griffiths could be back on the Jets roster in the new year after yet another twist in his ongoing contract saga. Today, the club not only rejected a reduced offer from a Chinese club, Beijing, to buy him, but knocked back 
any further negotiations. The chairman has indicated that he doesn't wish to enter into further discussions and, and that's it. And um, um, we have to respect those wishes, notwithstanding that um, um, Joel, Joel has indicated desires elsewhere. On Sunday, Sasho Petrovsky will start his 100th A-League game from the bench, but hopes to have a similar impact to last week, only this time against North Queensland. Jim Callanan, NBN News. The couple in their 60s, known to neighbours as Lil and Bob, were found by a family member in their lounge room at around one o'clock yesterday afternoon. A crime scene was established at the Threkel Drive home and will remain in place until the cause of death is determined. So there's no, no obvious signs of death at this stage and um, obviously if there's any members of the public that have any information, please contact Crime Stoppers. Neighbours say they hadn't seen the man or woman since Wednesday evening. Yeah, we canvassed the areas when completely. We've spoken to a number of neighbours. They're, they're both elderly people and uh, they have a number of, uh, I guess, illnesses that uh, restrict their movement. So we're just trying to like trace back their final movements. According to neighbours, the couple had lived in the property for around 10 years and while the man kept to himself, they saw a lot of his wife. She was a lovely old lady that lived across the road. She'd often bring toys over for the kids and it's a shame that she's gone. Like, it's not the same, not going to be the same without us. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. Yeah, we canvassed the areas when completely. We've spoken to a number of neighbours. They're, they're both elderly people and uh, they have a number of, uh, I guess, illnesses that uh, restrict their movement. So we're just trying to like trace back their final movements. The opening of the Iron Bark Creek floodgates to reintroduce tidal flows to the swamp marks stage two of the rehabilitation project. The first floodgate was opened 12 months ago, more than 40 years after eight gates were installed. It um, improved the agricultural capacity of the land, but it had some adverse in impacts on the ecosystem. The reopening is expected to restore the health of the swamp, encouraging the return of migratory birds as well as fish and prawns. Actually we're starting to pick up a few king prawns over here now, which is coming out of the thing after one gate after 12 months. So it's up and going already. Not a big lot, but there's some coming down. And prawn fishermen hope they keep coming with the season looking pretty poor at the moment. One boat on Monday morning shot it at the terrace and he got one kilo of prawns. And he said, oh, that little it wasn't funny. The remaining floodgates will be open progressively over the next few years. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. Today's sunshine, a far cry from the rained out opening day, but it did little to brighten up Bert Cockley. The homegrown fast bowler has turned spectator this summer, care of back stress fractures. Sitting here and watching and sort of knowing you should be out there sort of playing and it's, yeah, it hurts, it just sort of getting at your feet. The Blues quick soon had company after Phil Jakes and Usman Kawaja both fell cheaply. It didn't deter Phil Hughes though, as the former test opener put his stamp on this game. With something of a point to prove, the Blues young gun blazed away to race past 50. Bryce McGain became a particular target as Hughes kept up his attack. On 77, a sign his luck this summer is finally starting to turn, with a chance in the deep not only missed, but going for six. Ben Rora not so lucky, trapped in front for 38 by Andrew McDonald. David Warner doesn't know slow, and 20 runs in four Bryce McGain deliveries saw him skip away before lunch. It was after the interval that Hughes got to taste the feeling he's been missing of late with a well-deserved century. Very next ball though, Warner went. While Hughes reached 122 before he departed to spark a mini collapse, 
Another two quickly followed to have the Blues on the back foot, but still well placed late on day two. Their message was clear. 25 protesters did everything they could to stop coal from reaching the port of Newcastle. They claim every little bit counts when you're fighting climate change. We are extremely unhappy and wanted to say so in the strongest terms with the continuing failure of, of global leaders to solve the climate crisis. It was far from the riotous scenes of Copenhagen, but police showed up in numbers. The amount of policing resources we have to deploy to these type of incidents impacts on um, our response to the general community and ties up a lot of resources, which is, which is hard to manage. 86-year-old Bill Ryan came from Wollongong to make his points. Some were arrested without incidents, others put up more of a struggle. The police are really brutal and used for us. Newcastle councillor Michael Osborne among those cut from the rail line. I think Kevin Rudd's pathetic. Just uh, in the pocket of polluters. Each of these trains carries about 8,000 tonnes of coal. Since nine this morning, the protesters have delayed about six. And in this industry, time equals money. Uh, we wanted to make sure it was a long-lasting protest that would, that would grab people's attention and make sure this message got through. Nat Wallace, NBN News. Starting the day at none for five and with plenty more to get, Nick Jewell sparkled from the very first ball. Josh Hazelwood zeroed in on Chris Rogers and he picked out Kawaja. Blue skipper Moses Enriques then did some major damage, trapping Lloyd Mash in front. To bring David Hussey to the crease, he scored a double century last time he played here. A second ball duck this time and the Blues knew how important that was. Around the good, some ordinary. Mitch Stark didn't need their help after delivering a gem to Jewel as the Bush Rangers lost three for nine. Cameron White made it to 14 before Stark added to his count. Andrew McDonald didn't trouble the scorers at all as Grant Lambert drew him into a false stroke and David Warner did the rest. Six for 90, the Vic steadied things after lunch through John Hastings. And Matthew Wade, who left Ben Rohrer really feeling blue after this blow to the head which saw him leave the field for treatment. 
After a 127 run, Stan Wade joined him after the Blues finally held on to one in the deep. Brisbane had never lost a game at the Mariners' home ground, a record that rarely looked in danger last night, especially when raw young gun Tommy Orr put the visitors in front inside 10 minutes. With Socceroos coach Pim Verbeek in the stands, Mariners striker Matt Simon had his chance to push for a place in the Australian squad, but he refused to accept this early Christmas present. It was another Dutchman who then made the Mariners pay as Sergio van Dijk unleashed a stunning long-range strike. With the roar dominating, Craig Moore proved to be in a generous mood. His shocking back pass, the perfect gift for Nicky Travis, and the Mariners were back in the game. In the second half, the Mariners continued to push forward and were eventually rewarded thanks to an inspired substitution. The Central Coast had chances to claim all three points, Alex Wilkinson denied on the line. But just as a draw seemed likely, Brisbane was awarded a free kick in a dangerous position. When the Coast failed to clear, Mackay made them pay. The win pushing the roar above the Mariners and into the top six. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. An act of desperation, a man clinging to a sacred tree destined to make way for the $300 million Buller Dealer Bypass. The tree is important because it is a symbol, the symbol of traditional tribal life. Aboriginal elders have been fighting a decision to chop down the guardian tree for more than a year. Legal challenges have so far failed. The RTA plans to remove the tree in two days' time. It won't be chopped up, it'll be preserved and moved to another site once the highway upgrades are complete. It would be an act of aggression, it would be like an act of war. And they won't go quietly. Police were set to move in late today. The tree's only hope is Federal Environment Minister Peter Garrett. He's considering an emergency protection order. I think Peter Garrett should be totally ashamed of himself. The RTA says any delays would potentially cost lives on the highway. Nat Wallace, NBN News.
Just days out from Christmas, Wall's End MP Sonia Hornery got to play Santa. Supporters and staff had been hurriedly gathered to hear the news the facility would stay in public hands. Their reaction, one of pure emotion. Sonia Hornery paid a personal price for her part in the fight. Demoted in government, today she kept her focus on her constituents. The residents and their families can go to sleep on Christmas Eve and know that they have a home and they'll continue to have a home in Wallsend. Velia McMillan's elderly father, Rocco Mickley, suffers dementia. Today's announcement bringing relief to his concerned family. Oh, I feel great. I feel like crying and laughing at the same time. Campaigners had feared quality of care for the nearly 100 residents would suffer under a private operator. And to see a decision which, well, which acknowledges that care about people is important is something that is really wonderful. There's pressure to ensure privatisation remains firmly off the agenda. What the Greens are calling for is a clear commitment from the New South Wales Government that the Walls End Aged Care is going to stay in public hands permanently. But for now... It's time to celebrate. It's going to be a very Merry Christmas. The four turbine power station can deliver 660 megawatts of electricity to the grid in less than 30 minutes. It will fire up during peak periods such as the middle of a summer's day and admits 40% less carbon emissions than coal-fired power stations. The coal plants are, are far less flexible so they need to be committed into service. They take uh, over a day to get into service and then once they're in service you try and keep them there. Those behind the station say it also reduces the risk of blackouts. Because it's there for the peak uh, and it's there at short notice, then if there is uh, unexpected spikes in demand, then you can start these and they'll rush up into full load and meet that demand to avoid blackouts. At present, the power station can only operate for five hours at a time, but it can be converted into a 24-hour facility, and that will be a real option if a carbon emissions tax is placed on the now cheaper alternative, coal. As we move into a carbon-constrained future, we see a price placed on carbon through a CPRS. Gas is going to become a competitive fuel source. That will mean that more electricity will be generated uh, using gas-fired uh, power stations. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News.
By his own admission, Sasho Petrovsky's career has turned full circle, but the born-again striker's journey this season almost reflects the fortunes of his club. Down and out only weeks ago, Petrovsky has scored two late goals to help the Jets rise up the competition ranks. One ensuring his 100th A-League game was something special. Kept everything. Got the match ball, got the jersey. So we'll frame it up and put it all together and that'll be the memories. It was nearly remembered for the goal that didn't happen. Petrovsky netted one earlier in the game, only to be denied by a dubious offside call. So when the match winner did go in, the celebration really could begin. Even if that jersey did stay on. My wife says uh, to wish song... Um, many thanks because I didn't get booked. It followed a solid if not pretty night for Newcastle with the first goal coming from the feet of North Queensland while Song sliced home to double their lead before the break. While the Fury fought back to give the Jets a scare near the end, the real problem remains with the playing surface. Hopefully um, you know, they do something about it and you know, get it up to scratch so we can play even better. Jim Callanan, NBN News. With all the talk of a test recall, Phil Hughes was after an innings to match his first dig of 122. That brought Usman Khawaja to the crease, and he didn't miss a beat. Nor did Phil Jakes. Fighting for his own chance to get back into the test side, the Blues opener launched into the Vicks attack in a 213-run stand. The most important run of that coming just before lunch. Jakes didn't stop there, reaching 131 off 141 before holing out. Kawaja didn't slacken off as he reached triple figures for the second match in a row. While David Water began in the way he knows best, belting 48 in almost double time before the Blues called it at 3 for 306. That set the Bush Rangers 386 to win from 59 overs and the run chase got off to a rocky start. On news of his baggy green, Hughes also snared Mash. While David Hussey lasted just one as Mitchell Stark chimed in as the Blues gave themselves every chance of taking all points on offer. I'm really happy but I'm really tired and yeah, really sore everywhere but I'm really happy and excited coming up for January. Home video captured the height of the storm as hailstones peppered backyards across the Hunter. Singleton was worst hit just before six o'clock last night. But unlike other storms in the town, it was wind, not hail, that caused most of the damage. This hardware storage shed nearly blew down when its brick foundations gave way. Marion Hall's house opposite was showered with debris. We just heard this all this big noise and, and then we looked out and I've seen all this uh, masonite or I think it's masonite or something all over there and I thought, oh, it's the garage door come the pieces. Civic video remains closed after part of its metal roof blew off, sending rain through the ceiling. We need the rain, we don't need the storms. <laughs> 
35 windows were smashed at the hospital and everywhere you looked today the clean-up was underway. Graders were used to clear fallen branches with some streets completely covered in shredded leaves. The storm revived memories of December 1996 when huge hailstones ripped through Singleton leaving parts of the town looking like a war zone. While last night's storm wasn't as severe as the 96 event, the damage was spread over a wider area. And with the storm season now in full swing, the SES says we should be preparing our homes for the next one. Possibly keep your gutters clear to help the water drain away. And also the gutters in your street to make sure that they're free from any obstacles to help that water drain away. And any trees that are around your house just to make sure they're trimmed and uh, not posing a danger to your residents. Paul Lobb, NBN News. We're now faced with a lot of threats of job cuts, no permanent um, employment for anybody in the future, possibly no permanent employment even for the ones that are currently fully time employed next year with all the changes coming ahead. Nestled between Holmes and Swansea's police station, this parcel of land is hot property. The Swansea Action Group doesn't want it turned into a 23-unit Department of Housing complex and during a five-hour protest, members asked motorists for their support. The group claims the state government's proposal doesn't fit council zoning. I can't buy a, house, a block of land here and build a house but these people can buy a block of land, put in 23 units to house 60 people and not answer to anybody. I just don't want my children growing up um, opposite public housing. Instead, the residents want the site developed into a retail or tourist attraction. Once this goes in, this is the end of the line for Swansea. Kevin Harmon lives next door and says it would cast a shadow over his home and he needs sunlight more than most. Since I've lost a leg, it's, uh, it's not very easy to find uh, warmth because you're not moving around very much. While the state government is also the project's consent authority, local MP Robert Coombs says it's being assessed independently and he doesn't support the move in its current form. Well, I think that they're too big. I've said consistently that the three storeys that's being proposed for the new constructions are exactly that, too large. Madeleine Bond, NBN News. This flies in the face of all that and I don't believe it would get any support by the Newcastle community to be opening that late. She may not be a household name, but Sister Ellen Savage is a true Australian hero. This remarkable woman um, was so much a part of that centaur story. So when it was discovered, I was just so excited. When the hospital ship went down off the Queensland coast on May 14, 1943, more than 250 Australians on board were lost. Most of those who survived, however, owed their lives to this special nurse and her quick thinking and survival skills. 
She actually was the only nurse survivor, the only medical personnel there, and, uh, and she actually helped 64 more people survive. Miss Savage went on to become the first matron of the Rankin Park Hospital in 1951, after completing her training at the same hospital in London that Florence Nightingale attended. And perhaps that very training was what prepared her for um, the, this extraordinary and remarkable event. Fittingly, the chapel at the John Hunter Hospital is named in the late sister's honour, while artwork marks her time at the Rankin Park facility. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. So I came here to learn more skills and basically it's given me a lot more than what I expected in the first place. I'm just hoping to get a good trade behind me and hopefully move, get a good opportunity to have a good future. Despite the cloud of suspicion that hovers over the club, there was still plenty of cheer at the night's Christmas party. Earlier, CEO Steve Burriston met with players and offered something of a Christmas wish of his own. We put a proposal to the guys this morning. Uh, we've asked them to have a think about that, take whatever advice that they need. Put simply, it's a plan to have year-round random drug testing, but the Knights boss admits it's a logistical and legal minefield. However, if the players sign on, the club will boast one of the most comprehensive testing regimes in the country. But what we're looking for is the ability to test anywhere at any time. Ironically, four players were randomly tested today under the club's current policy. But this new proposal is another sign the Knights are doing all they can amid allegations other players will be implicated in the Danny Wicks case. We have the will and we have the courage to take action if that's necessary and I think we've proven that in the past. Uh, but at the moment we're dealing with what's placed in front of us and the only thing placed in front of us at the moment is Danny Wicks. The forward is due back in court early February. Jim Callinan, NBN News. Phil Hughes's smile lit up a gloomy number one sports ground last night and rightfully so after he won back a spot in the test squad. His previous match here in January led to his test debut and a first inning century in this match sealed his recall. I suppose it's a ground I could say I'll... Uh, I'll never forget. <laughs> the finish to the clash between New South Wales and Victoria was anything but. After losing the entire first day, it was heading towards a thrilling finish, with the home side chasing five wickets in the last hour and a half for much needed outright points. But storm clouds saw the umpires halt play just when it was getting interesting. It was a great team effort, but um, to come off a bad light with an hour and a half to go, go with play um, was disappointing. What's encouraging is that New South Wales cricket is keen to cement Newcastle as an annual fixture, but there's no official confirmation just yet. Meanwhile, talk of a possible national 2020 franchise being based here in a new league run by Cricket Australia also remains strong. They'll look at the growth areas, places like in Newcastle, Western Sydney, Gold Coast. Uh, we're, we're still years away from it, probably minimum two, probably longer. For a marathoner, Lisa Flint is going places quick. After winning in Sydney earlier in the year, she added both the Melbourne and Australian titles to her list of achievements, the latter in personal best and Commonwealth Games qualifying time. I think it did surprise some other people, but then they've come back to me and said, oh, actually, yeah, we, we kind of thought you might have something later, I just didn't expect it so soon. The only thing I can think about is how far can I actually take this? That's music to the ears of her new coach, Scott Westcott, who can't believe his luck. 
A Commonwealth and World Championships competitor in his own right, he's not only found a training partner, but a talent still way off reaching her full potential. It's probably like, you know, perhaps dragging a, uh, a club footballer and uh, throwing them into the NRL and, and they shine. That's the kind of talent that's just immersed. Hence, the goals next year have shifted considerably for Flint, with the Delhi Commonwealth Games top of the list. But she's also looking long term in a discipline she's still learning so much about. Definitely 2012 is a big, big goal. And I don't know, Commonwealth Games are fantastic, but Olympics would just take the cake. Part of her preparations will be competing in a major track meet at Glendale on February 6, where she'll race a middle distance event as she pushes towards Australian selection. Jim Callanan, NBN News. Michael Fetch fears the proposed East Charlestown bypass could endanger his children's lives. If approved, the arterial road would run through nearby bushland, then along Handley Street and Beath Crescent, both of which border his property. Uh, there's a whole range of safety issues, uh, not to mention the environmental impact on Flaggy Creek. Lake Macquarie Council is conducting a traffic study to determine if such a road would improve road conditions between Whitebridge and Cahiba. Ultimately, it would connect Bulls Garden and Cahiba roads, possibly through extending Warren Road. This thing's going to split a community in half, and I don't think they realise just how many cars are going to use this road. But that's exactly why Mayor Greg Piper says a study needs to be done. Unless we look at all the options, then we can't ever definitively rule out Warren Road extension. Mayor Piper says on paper, a route through Warren Road makes the most sense, but that alone won't be a determining factor. Council is very mindful of the, 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 the development pattern, the residential pattern through there, and we may not proceed. I suspect that we will not. Council is expected to vote on the issue early next year. Madeleine Bond, NBN News. Carved out of the rocks by convicts around 1820, the Bogey Hole is one of the oldest ocean baths in New South Wales. And despite the chronic lack of maintenance by the State Department of Lands, which is responsible for it, it remains a popular attraction. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's really nice. It's um, clean and, yeah, it's a lovely place to swim. But to get to and from the water, swimmers need to negotiate the crumbling and slippery stairs via a rusty old handrail. The safety chain that once hung between these posts to prevent people being washed into the sea has long gone. The entrance down here with the stairs and things is, is pretty dangerous, to be honest, and uh, with it being wet as well, easily to fall over, slip in. The Department of Lands wants to transfer ownership of the swimming spot to Newcastle Council, but Councillor Aaron Bierman says the state should repair it first. Look, I'm tired of the city being given assets in a bad state of repair and then we're left the, with the bill, one, to maintain it and two, to repair it. Um, if we're going to take it, the, the ratepayer has to rest assured that this major tourist attraction is looked after. 
I don't think it would take much just to put in a few more handrails and fix up the steps. The site is part of a taxpayer-funded study currently being conducted on coastal assets between Stockton and Merriweather. Paul Lobb, NBN News. A seven-hour operation to remove the tree ended just before five this afternoon, with the move considered necessary by the RTA to start work on a $300 million Pacific Highway bypass. Protesters were kept away from the site and became agitated as the tree fell. Right now it means the end of my dreaming. That's it, finish, yeah? Everything that's been, it's been here for thousand years. Thousand years my people have been coming here. Earlier, police arrested a 49-year-old from Elands near Wingham who climbed the tree two days ago. The police and the rescue squad commenced their operation to try and retrieve him. He went further up the tree and actually secreted himself in a large hollow in the tree trunk. The RTA plans to preserve the tree at another site nearby. Nat Wallace, NBN News. Jets fans know Neil Young has been good this year and it seems Santa agrees. The keeper has received two perfect Christmas presents. The clash with the glory will allow him a day and a half with his Perth-based family, as well as the opportunity to defy his critics in the West. It's something I've really wanted to do. Um, this is the, the game I really wanted to play. Um, there's some fans back there like, you know, I'd like to play in front of and prove a point to, basically. Keeping cool at training this morning... It's his composure between the posts that has seen him become the Jets' number one. He's now planning a cool reception for his doubters, particularly the glory coach. Yeah, Dave Mitchell gave me one training session. Yeah, he's a nice guy. Yeah, so, so <laughs> that's about as good as I can go with that. Sorry, because yeah, he's um, he never never gave me a chance. So, Young suffered a minor hand injury in the opening minutes of the win over the Fury, but it's not enough to stop him from trying to stop the glory and extend the Jets' winning streak. Keep the run going, you know, who knows where we'll end up. Um, you know, it'd be good to win in Perth, I don't think anyone's done it this year. Um, to make it five in a row would be great as well. Young's captain Matt Thompson admits he was surprised by his selection in the Socceroos squad. If Pim Verbeek gives the midfielder an indication he's in the running for a place at the World Cup, he says he'll consider pursuing a short-term contract overseas in January. That's something I could, I could talk to him about. I mean, he might turn around and say, you've got, you got no chance and that's... No worries, no problem, but if he sits there and, and sort of says you might want to keep yourself moving, well then by all means you'd be stupid not to. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. For so long, the big-hitting boy from the Hunter struggled to realise his full potential. Now, thanks to his golf coach and life coach, 
Kurt Barnes is focused and itching to compete with the world's best. It took me six years to realise that natural ability doesn't get you far in this game and my hard work's starting to pay off. For years, Barnes believed playing in the US was the only option until he took a chance in Asia. I made the correct decision this year to go to Japan. I really enjoy it. I enjoy the food, enjoy the culture. They love the Australians and I'm really looking forward to going over there and really having the opportunity to set my life up. Barnes will put down the clubs for several weeks in order to relax and enjoy a family Christmas in Musselbrook. He'll compete in a series of tournaments in Australia early next year before trying to make a mark in Japan. The old terms, I'm like a racehorse at the starting gate. I, I just, I'd love to be over there now the way I'm playing. And I think I, the scary thing is I can only improve. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. It's 9am and Sergeant Ben Searle is ready to hit the road for day six of Operation Safe Arrival. He heads straight to a speeding hotspot where incredibly every passing motorist breaks the law. So this is only a 50 zone. Right. So every one of those cars is speeding. Pretty much, yeah. One motorist is detected driving 15 kilometres over the limit. The reason we stopped today, your speed was checked at 65 in the 50 zone. Yep. Is there any reason for travelling oh, at that speed? Mate, no. That's six points and $197 gone. And drivers on the Newcastle Link Road proved no better. 104 and a 90. Is it 106? At 11.30, it's time for speed checks along University Drive, a 60 zone. Seconds later, another driver's clocked at 75. On Hunter Street, Sergeant Searle runs a number plate through his mobile data terminal. Sure enough, the car is unregistered. That's a $506 fine. Quite often you see a label that oh, should be expired. Um, you do a check on the MDT and it came up unregistered. But the Highway Patrol says it isn't just on the road to issue fines, it's there to save lives. 51 people have died on Hunter Roads this year. And I just hope that drivers uh, take a warning of this, particularly over the Christmas New Year period, and, uh, and not drink and drive and not speed. Madeline Bond, NBN News. The only way you ever get an outcome to something is if people all sort of grab on the, uh, onto the one thing and give it a good pull and off we go. And uh, we're saying hop into the boat and get paddling because we need your help and assistance to get us on the right course. Catholic Bishop Michael Malone admits the past couple of years have been some of the most challenging in his 15-year reign over the Newcastle Maitland Diocese as the church dealt with further allegations against priests. We feel embarrassed and overwhelmed as if a cloud covers our work. And what we need to do is to 
be very conscious of the evangelizing mission of the church and to, despite these the setbacks, to do our best to continue that. Earlier in the year, the 70-year-old appealed to the Pope for an assistant who will become his successor in the next few years. He admits recent events have taken their toll. It's added to some of my stress. Um, so asking for help um, may be contributed to that a little, but I also want a bit of a seamless transition from when I reach retirement age. Anglican Bishop Brian Farron is spending this Christmas with his growing tribe of grandchildren. His church too has endured scandal and heartache over the past year. I'm deeply saddened by it. I recognise that in many ways it's a blight, but in the end, I think, if we do things well and follow the processes scrupulously which we've been doing, um, people who have been hurt in the past can actually become liberated from that hurt. So I think there's a central... Uh, trusting of the core message of Christian faith and hope. got some extra hams, we've got some extra chicken. Um, we're expecting that the numbers could probably be the biggest uh, ever in the eight years that we've had at uh, the Christmas lunch in the park. It was the nightmare before Christmas. I'm being positive. I'm not going to let Christmas stress me. So I'll get one in a minute. It's only been two minutes. Westfield Katara was abuzz with last minute shoppers. How's the Christmas shopping going today? Uh, all right. <laughs> Nightmare. Will you get it done in time, do you think? Absolutely. How many hours have got? Four hours. Absolutely. I'll, a few more hours running around and all done. All hands were on deck at the Newcastle Fish Co-op. A record 10 tonnes of prawns have gone over the counter in two days. Now I got here at half past three and there were people lined up out the front already waiting, waiting for us to open. And apparently just before we opened there was about 500 people outside. CDs and DVDs also attracted long queues. Chances are Susan Boyle will be in a stocking or two. How many would you be selling? Uh, I think we're looking at over probably 100 an hour. As always, toys have been big. Model trains had their fair share of admirers, but it was this gadget that proved a real money spinner. Ten, twenty years ago, well, there was nothing like what's on the market now. Christmas wouldn't be complete without the man of the moment, although some weren't quite getting into the spirits. And the most important thing to remember is that you're never too old for Christmas. And what would you like for Christmas, young man? A bigger pay packet, sir. Ho, ho, ho! Matt Wallace, NBN News. Philip Baird has been giving the gift of life for 56 years and today marked his 231st whole blood donation. Been looking forward to it for a long time but uh, I got confirmation from Guinness World Records uh, a couple of weeks ago to say that the record was there for the taking and this morning we've done it. Philip first gave blood back in 1954 during his time in the army where it was compulsory but the need to donate never dimmed. I always felt that if there was someone that I loved needed blood I'd be uh, I wouldn't fare well within myself if I wasn't a blood donor. Today, his timing was perfect, with blood supplies in demand over the holiday period. Christmas is always a lot of road accidents, uh, plus we have the public holidays, mm -hmm. so there's always a need for more. As his family proudly watched on, Philip was rewarded for his dedication with a certificate of appreciation and a cake. His generous donations, certainly something to celebrate. If you multiply the number of times I've given blood, it comes out to around about 700 people that I know that I've definitely served. Emma Murphy, NBN News.
when we built the factory, what we did is try to include as many environmental aspects as we can into the building. Some punters could feel like they're seeing things when the Opera House makes her debut on Boxing Day. The three-year-old filly, sired by champion stallion Zabil, is one of only seven pure white horses registered in Australia. Trained by Chris Lees, she'll start in race one over 1,400 metres. Every time she's stepped out on the track so far, uh, she's had a following. And being a white horse, if she starts to perform on the track, she'll develop a fan club like the old black horse, uh, the octagonal. The track is already being spruced up with workers making sure everything is in order for the biggest meeting crowd-wise of the year. The Newcastle Jockey Club is promising improved service for punters, a faster queuing system at food and drink stands and a quality field. All races are uh, large enough to have each, each way betting which is certainly good for the crowd on Boxing Day who are generally not your average punters. Gates open at 10am with the first race at 12.45. A day before Christmas, it's been business as usual for the Newcastle Jets. The team went head-to-head -head with its youth side, a final hit-out for the Boxing Day clash with Glory. An extended 16-man squad will fly over to Perth after Christmas lunch. The extra man is youngster Ben Kandorovsky, who returns from a one-match suspension. We've got great depth in the squad, so there's always a chance it was going to be difficult trying to get back into the team, so we'll see um, what Branko decides on game day. Franco Kalina had some words of advice for his teenage charger who's likely to force his way back into the starting lineup. He can play in defence, he can play in midfield, uh, good on the ball, he's good without the ball. Um, for his age, he's very good at, uh, at reading the game. One man who won't be on the field, though, is injured striker Michael Bridges, but the Englishman could be back next round. We've got a very tough uh, month after the new year and uh, we want to make sure that uh, our, all our squad is uh, f fighting fit for that. The Jets are keen to exploit the Glory's patchy form. They haven't won a match for a month. A victory would make the difficult timing of the Christmas road trip that much easier to swallow. Not the ideal um, position you want to be travelling on Christmas Day away from your family but um, hopefully we can get the job done over there in Perth. Kate Mitchell, NBN News.